That's confusing. <laughs> I think we're going here. Please check video resolution. Yeah, we're live. We, we were live. Hey guys, if anybody's on, looks like we got five viewers on here. It's kind of showing us some uh, video from two minutes ago. Hang on, hang with us while we get this set up. I think that's going now. Oh, that's going to not work very well. Thanks for hanging with us while we get this set up, guys. Bootstrap Farmer says we're good. Okay, cool. <laughs> Excellent. That is a good sign. Well, we wanted to get on a couple minutes early and make sure that this was all working well. And uh, this two screen thing is a little <laughs> throwing me off. So, um, should we get started? We had to wait a couple minutes? I think we got like two minutes, right? Okay. So let's talk about what is that screen over there? The delay. Yeah. Don't look at the delay. It's confusing. Okay. <laughs> It's like uh, Bill and Ted's are watching ourselves from the past right now. <laughs> are we social distanced enough? I don't think we are. Yeah, don't cough on me. <laughs> oh, Too, soon. Stuff. Too soon. Too soon. Yeah. Anytime yeah. anybody coughs in public, I, I'm like freaking out. I go wash my hands. Are you going really. in public right now? Not really. I thought you'd sequestered yourself to the apartment. And... Yeah, not, not really going out that much. But. I was like walking around today. Coffee shop have to go coffees for you now? Or? I do have to go coffees. Yeah. Not the same experience though, huh? Definitely not the same experience. A little depressing, actually. Yeah. Even though I think they're doing pretty well. Hmm. Which is great. They have some very loyal customers. So yeah. That's, I'm grateful for that. Uh, so their, their to-go has been working out pretty pretty well. So yeah. they're still offering food and like breakfast tacos and stuff. We went to a to-go burger place uh, yesterday and pulled up in the car. Guy comes running out, said, hey, have you already called in your order? Uh, if not, you know, just tell me what you need. And he ran in, put in the order, uh, came back out, I handed him cash. And I was like, keep the change, man. He's busy. Yeah. Uh, they were pretty busy. Yeah. yeah they, were, they were doing good business. And, uh, you know, it was, it was good. It was uh, not the same experience as eating the restaurant, but. Um, right. You know, we got some really good burgers and french fries, so. That's great. Looks like it's six o'clock, guys. We were kind of hanging out, waiting to see uh, how many people would jump on here. Um, I think somewhere it shows us on there. Yeah, we got a few people on. So, um, welcome tonight to Urban Farm Academy. Uh, the topic is creating a hyper-local food hub. I'm Jeff Bednar. Um, I'm Josh Montgomery. And uh, so we, we have Profound Foods. We're located out of Dallas. If you followed uh, Urban Farm Academy and uh, Bootstrap Farmer or any of that, uh, we're, we're real good friends with everybody and uh, we've, we've you know done a lot of stuff together. So um, all that being said, Nick had got on and uh, Brandon had asked me and Josh to jump on and talk for a little while about you know the, the pivot that we've made in our company in the last Two weeks. Two weeks. I mean, is it over two weeks? It's like two weeks. It's in a day. Two so, weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so, uh, where to start? I, th I guess we could start a little bit about where we, uh, what we do or what we did, uh, and how we got to where we were, and then the pivot we made, and then we can talk about some of our plans for the future. So, um, I guess I'll jump in if that's all right with you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sounds so, uh, Profound Foods is a food hub that we created in 2018. Um, we came up with the idea for it in, I think, uh, February, and uh, we had already had Profound Micro Farms. So, Profound Micro Farms I founded with my wife uh, five and a half years ago, and uh, Profound Micro Farms is a two-acre farm. We've got about 17,000 square feet of greenhouses with about 10,000 in production. Uh, and up until two weeks ago, we were growing around 150 varieties of leafy greens, culinary herbs, edible flowers, and microgreens for uh, chefs and restaurants. So we started Profound Foods, the food hub, because we had some other farmers and we started seeing some problems in the marketplace with farms working with restaurants. That We saw that these chefs really, really wanted to, to work with farms and um, farmers would love to sell the restaurants in the kind of quantity they needed and that kind of thing, but there was not a, they just didn't know each other, didn't know how to connect. And then there was a lot of questions there, as well as you know all the problems that come with working with restaurants. With you know the invoicing, the net thirty terms, the um, you know the the having to have the same thing every single week and the regularity of that. 
uh, and kind of figuring out the whole process uh, as well as scaling because then you've got to, you know, now you're manning delivery vehicles and, uh, you know, all of the logistics that come in. So not only are you managing the farm, but you're managing all of these things. So uh, I saw that they started to become difficult for me to manage. And uh, I was also watching that be difficult for a couple of farmer buddies of mine. So we decided that if we started this food hub, that we would be able to uh, take a lot of the, you know, a lot of those problems we were having, a lot of problems the restaurants were having, and put all those into a separate company uh, and actually create a viable business out of making, you know, helping farmers and helping chefs. So, uh, you know, that it kind of took off like a rocket ship. You know, when we launched it, uh, it that's, we were total in, in total working with about 25 restaurants between me and the other farmers. Uh, and that was a year and a half ago. Yeah, is that about right? So a year and a half ago, uh, we had 25 restaurants. And uh, in a year and a half's time, we uh, just, you know, uh, we went viral. <laughs> Sorry, a little probably too soon for that. So uh, the, the business just kind of took off. We, uh, two weeks ago, we had 130 restaurants that we were supplying uh, and about 65, 70 on a weekly basis. And, you know, some were occasional and that sort of thing. But uh, we had a ton of restaurants and chefs that we were working with. We really, really liked working with chefs. We were looking forward to kind of building and growing that company. We had a goal of actually hitting almost 250 restaurants this year. Um, and then we also grew from being three producers into having 35 producers, uh, which is the number we were at two weeks ago. Uh, do you remember how many people we've added in the last two weeks? How many people? Uh, how many home? producers, farmers, ranchers, and producers? Uh, the past two weeks, I'd say at least seven. Seven, yeah. yeah. So we're, you know, 40, 45, somewhere in there. Um, and that would be, you know, all kinds of different local farmers, ranchers, and producers. Uh, the producers could be, you know, cheese or goat cheese. We've got um, some bread uh, artisans, a bakery, um, dairy, that sort of thing. So um, what we built over the year and a half's time was an online marketplace that was super easy to use and handled all of our invoicing and our infrastructure. Uh, and, I, and Josh really implemented that. Um, so we could probably talk about that in just a minute. Yeah. But um, basically we, we took all of these things that we, we had and we were building a structure that we could replicate in other places. The idea behind Profound Foods is that we wanna make a profound impact on our community and a profound impact uh, you know, on our community's nutrition and on the environment by bringing them uh, these nutrient-rich foods that are grown locally uh, using less food miles and all that. So our mission really hasn't changed, um, kind of like our business model, but it was focused to chefs. So uh, two weeks ago, it started to get real uh, when we saw other cities starting to close down restaurants. And uh, you know we, we had some conversations really early on saying, hey, this is inevitable, this is going to come and it's gonna affect us. And we were completely overexposed because we had 100% restaurant business. Uh, we didn't do any retail whatsoever. I've never worked a farmer's market. You know, I don't have the retail relationship uh, with people. So we had, uh, really didn't have any other outlet. So over the course of two weeks, we watched as uh, our restaurant orders completely plummeted um, uh, the week one. We timed this pretty good because we saw it coming. So we had about a week to prepare. Was it about a week or? Yeah, at least like, yeah. Half a week. It, it, I mean, time to time. It, it felt like it went really quick, though. We've been counting time by the hours lately. Uh, you know, there is no more days. It's things are changing by the hour. Yeah. So two weeks ago, we did an announcement um, on a uh, actually on a on a Sunday, we announced that we were going to start retail home deliveries, and uh, we already had the infrastructure. We had these refrigerated vans. We had online ordering, so the it made a lot of sense for us to go to the retail market, especially given the demand and grocery stores selling out. So we launched this. Uh, retail home delivery business in six, uh, four zip codes, uh, in very limited area, um, and it's kind of took off. Our first week we had 56 orders, uh, and that was from two days of our ordering period. So there was only ordering for two days, and the first day there was only about 12 products available due to a glitch in our system. So the second day we orders picked up. Uh, we did about was it 30, 30, 3200, 3600 dollars in business. The first week? Yeah. That sounds about right. So, you know, we did we did okay business. I think our average ticket was about $50. We learned a ton of lessons. And so this next week, we signed up a ton more people. In fact, there's almost 2,000 people that have registered for an account on uh, profoundfoods.com, which is our, our website for the Food Hub. And uh, we had uh, 90 orders for retail home deliveries last week. And the, the number that we did actually was on par with our average week of, to restaurants three or four weeks ago. So it, we did almost the same amount of money um, and we actually have a little bit different margin because it is more expensive to manage these home deliveries. Uh, you know, we learned some lessons with having two drivers in the car and, and stuff like that. But 
Uh, so we're, we're looking at the projection right now of like, if we did that in two weeks with 90 home deliveries that were successful, kind of where can we go from there? So uh, we're watching out for some uh, messages coming in here. If you guys have any questions, we'll get to those kind of uh, towards the end or uh, you know, if there's anything in particular, we would absolutely love and appreciate any questions, maybe keep us on the rails a little bit. Uh, but Josh, you want to take a second and talk about one of the, um, how we were able to use our platform and our system and resources to make the pivot yeah. to retail? Sure. Well, first, let me start by explaining what system we use. We use a system called Local Food Marketplace, and it's designed pretty much exclusively for what we're doing for food hubs, not necessarily for restaurant business, but just for food hubs across across the country. And so we, we chose Local Food Marketplace because it has a great user interface for our restaurants or our customers, but then also on the back end, it handles everything from invoicing, from summarizing orders, from putting in products, it allows farmers to come in and create profiles and create like their own products in the system and list their prices and get reports. The farmers can get reports themselves. They have a whole portal where they have a report section. They can see exactly you know, how they're doing, what products are listed, they can manage their own availability. And so it was a perfect tool to be able to open up to home delivery and our, whole, our retail customers, because essentially we were just able to create a new type of customer within local food marketplace. So we really didn't have to change a whole lot except for a couple products and some categories, which took quite a bit of time. But um, yeah, I think that was probably, for me, that was one of our biggest challenges is that we're used to working with chefs and yeah. chefs and restaurants don't buy, or I'm sorry, uh, chefs and uh, retail home delivery customers are not buying the same products. Right. Um, it's and, still something we're going through right now. Yeah. And then quantities, you know, we, we sold lettuce by the case. In a case was going to be 24 to 30 heads and uh, it's $48 yeah. to a restaurant. And there's not a ton of people that need $48 worth of lettuce that won't fit in their refrigerator at home. Uh, and, you know, we were doing hundreds of cases a week. So that was a, that's been kind of a big adjustment there is to look at, you know, now we're repackaging everything, and including working with some of our farmers. Um, you know, one of the things we'll share with you guys tonight is some of the things that have been the most challenging for us. Um, you know, one thing is, is taking down and saying, hey, now we're going to stop selling everything that we were selling bulk and sell it by the each, by the bunch. Uh, we've never sold things by the bunch. It was always for chefs. We kind of packaged it in a different way and we put it inside of a clamshell or we, uh, you know, would bag it and sell it by the bag, not, not by the quantity of it. Uh, and chefs just got used to it because they were ordering every single week. And the retail market's been a world different. Um, I think one of the challenges that we're still working on that was one of the, our biggest frustrations on our last loading day, it actually took hours to do, I, I think we were loading for five hours. So we set out all these totes, every customer, 90 of them had a different tote. And then we would go through and say, okay, uh, you know, Johnson, uh, one quart of yogurt, and then we put that into Johnson's tote. Um, one thing that really messed us up is some of our producers sell things by weight. And, uh, you know, so if someone sold uh, 50 packs of chicken breasts and every single one had a different weight, then we needed to go and enter in that exact weight and make sure that exact uh, chicken breast ended up in the customer's thing because that's what they paid for by the weight. Yeah. Um, so the lesson we learned there is that it's extremely time consuming and there's so many failure points with it. So now we're working with our producers that are doing proteins in particular, that uh, instead of going by weight, they should just sell it by unit. So a chicken breast is gonna be this much and it could be a little bit on the lighter side, could be a little on the heavier side, but the average is gonna work out. And for us then we can just look at chicken breast, okay, boom, put that into the tote and we're good to go versus having to find specific ones. Um, yeah, that's, that is a huge problem. So. And we have some awesome producers that we work with. We had one producer who the first week, he took the time to label every single one of yeah. his products with the exact weight and with the name of the customer, which was, which was really cool. So. And one of, the, one of the things we found out about that is that some people, there's a spot that says organization when you register, and that's where a chef would put the name of their restaurant. So a lot of people actually filled in like their ranch name, even though it's not a real ranch, or you know, it's a, their uh, hobby ranch or whatever. Uh, some people put household. Our one home. of them put, yeah, Jeff's yeah. friend, you know. Yeah. And uh, so what happened was is in our system, that's what it labeled it at to our producers. So I got all these packages that says Jeff's friend, but we don't know what to, you know, which tote that that went in. So that was that was one of the challenges as well for us on the, on the system side. But I think overall that was really smooth. We were able to uh, onboard a whole bunch of new customers without uh, a whole lot of ease. 
And I think that that speaks a lot about, you know, we were planning on doing different business models in the future. And that was one of the reasons we chose to go with really robust uh, systems in the beginning. And I think that the kind of the lesson to take away from anybody that's interested in, you know, building a system in their area is the more robust you are, is the more resilient you are. Um, we were able to just basically flip the switch, turn on a new type of buyer, and uh, we could we could go with our systems. Um, the, uh, the parts of it that didn't work so well is that we were not uh, skilled and equipped to deal 91 or 90 restaurant customers and pack them all in a day and have there be dairy, meat, and greens, and soil vegetables, and edible, uh, not edible, but um, flower bouquets uh, that stood up taller than the tote was, so now we can't stack these totes. Um, yeah. And we also dealt with, uh, you know, we have a lemon of a truck. We've got two of these brand new uh, vans that we leased, and there's constantly one of them is broken down, even though they both have less than 4,000 miles. Uh, and they're both refrigerated vans, so we're kind of battling this, uh, you know, vehicle working thing. So, yeah. um, I'll, I'll take a second to step back a little bit. One of the things that happened really quick the first week, so we're two weeks in, but the first week, uh, we realized on Profound Microfarm side, which is separate than Profound Foods, the food hub, is that most of what we grow, uh, most of what we grow, uh, is not things that will sell well to retail customers. Um, you know, we did do the, you know, lettuces, kales, chard. Those are things that are going to sell well. We've got some uh, onion chives, garlic chives. Uh, those are going to sell pretty well. Uh, but what's not going to sell well is ice plant, ice lettuce, the Augustache flowers, um, you know, the pineapple sage. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, we grow like 12 or 15 kinds of mint. And, you know, people know mint, that you're going to use mint, but it's probably going to be common mint. Maybe they'll get excited and try chocolate mint, but how many clamshells a week or how many containers or pounds a week can we sell and have that be profitable? So we had to make some really hard decisions on the farm side um, in order to be able to keep going through this. So on the farm side, we decided that we, we've got um, uh, a small greenhouse that's 2,000 square feet. We've got one that's almost complete, uh, the Devil's River Whiskey Greenhouse. It's 3,000 square feet. And then our big greenhouse, that's 8,000. And that's where most of our production was happening. Uh, until last week. So we made the decision to actually cut back about 70% of production. So in the last week, we or last two weeks, we've been calling out lots and lots of things, red vein sorrel, petite mustard greens. Um, you know, a lot of our mints got called out, all of our nasturtium, our pea shoot, a lot of our pea shoots. And we've been downsizing and moving into, um, moving into products that are gonna sell more, but at the same time, we know that there's gonna be a ramping up period. And now we have two weeks of sales to know that, hey, we need to have X dollars in labor on the farm side and X dollars in electricity and that kind of thing. And, and the way that we're growing inside of, uh, you know, 17,000 square feet of greenhouses is very energy intensive. So we decided that we're gonna shut down our north greenhouse until restaurant business starts picking back up or until we can pick and choose the varieties that we're gonna sell really well uh, that we can actually grow into back into production. So what that meant was is that we had to uh, stop working on some projects. Um, we also had to lay off a couple of guys. And, uh, you know, as hard as that was, uh, you know, as a business owner, that was one of the decisions we had to make in order to be able to make it. You know, we, we can't go forward and spend money on labor that we're doing, we don't have any income. Uh, we also had to get really real about the $35,000 so we have in outstanding invoices to restaurants that have no source of income now. Uh, you know, we had a lot of them on net 15 or net 30 terms, and there's a good chance that we're, we may not get paid back on all of those. Um, and so we made promises to other farmers about getting them paid, and we've got, you know, there's a lot of stuff like that. So it gave us that net 30 actually gave us a little bit of benefit because those first two weeks we kept on getting some checks in. So we didn't really see the dip, uh, and we won't for another couple of weeks, provided yeah. that restaurants are still paying their bills, uh, which is a you know, it's not, it's not a clear and sure thing right now. Yeah, uh, so obviously, clear. you know, given the, the decisions that are being made. Um, and, you know, probably the, one of the hardest parts for me about this whole transition is watching nearly, uh, you know, 99% of our customers go from doing great and, uh, you know, doing exciting things, about to open new restaurants, opening ho new hotels, to everything just got put on hold two weeks ago. And they are now laid off most of their people. They're out of jobs themselves. There's not a clear prospect. Um, you know, you know, looking at what this is kind of doing to our economy, there's going to be no switching the, uh, flipping the switch back on and saying, okay, cool, let's go back to the way things are 
And I think that that's kind of setting in with a lot of people right now. Um, so that being said, it's, you know, it's really, um, you know, it's tough talking to our chefs right now and trying to figure that out. But on our distribution side, going with retail, there's so much opportunity because out of all of the different things that could have happened to our economy, uh, the, the, the combination that the virus had has got people thinking about food and where it's coming from. It's got people thinking about, you know, what goes into their food, how many people have handled it, who's coughing at the grocery store, um, you know, all of these things. So to, to launch, uh, you know, we don't feel like there's ever been a better time to launch a retail uh, at home delivery program so we can bring these foods direct to people's houses. Um, which is another thing that we're kind of perfectly situated for uh, geographically. So we're about 45 minutes north of Dallas. And we went from about 90% of our business being in downtown Dallas to 90% of our business being within about five miles of the farm. Uh, you know, we kind of, a lot of times we use the, the term urban farm, but we're really more of a suburban farm. And we're, you know, we're in the, the Plano McKinney, Frisco, uh, Allen, Lucas Fairview area. And there's so many people up here um, that it, 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 it's pretty easy. And we're, we're kind of lucky in the, the geographical area that we're at. It's actually pretty easy to get around to people to manage these deliveries. Um, you know, where the farm is, it's a little bit more spread out. Um, and the, the neighborhoods up here are pretty big, but it's also uh, a fairly wealthy community. So these are people that, um, you know, are not batting an eye at, you know, some of the prices that we're needing to charge right now on some products. Um, and we could probably go into how the food hub works a little bit too, to kind of explain where the, the, the idea behind, uh, the pricing structure and the whole model goes and how we're kind of different from a distribution hub. But, um, you know, we think there's a good time to do this. And so right now our, our main focus is to really work on building a resilient company from this point forward. We want to make sure that we're, we're being really smart, making long-term decisions and also keeping the short term in mind. So obviously everyone's number one concern is they're not supposed to leave their house. You're supposed to social distance, you know, what, where are you going to get the food for the grocery store? Uh, you know, job prospects. Uh, so it's important to, to see that there's a, a huge gap in the market right now where people are buying local food and they want to buy it. But there's also the, the kind of the foresight and the knowledge of thinking the way that a lot of people are trying to do this right now is uh, in my vision, uh, you know, just isn't sustainable. And, um, you know, one example would be there's a lot of farm boxes in the Dallas area where people are putting together, here's your $20 box, your $45 box, and it's got, uh, you know, whatever fruits and vegetables they're getting from yeah. the distributors uh, and just throwing it in the box. Then people are lining up in their cars, they're loading them into their, into their car and they're, they're driving off and they're selling a lot of them right now. But my thought is uh, that's kind of a short term thought. I don't think that that's going to last when we get back out of this here in a month or two or three months. I think people are going to start going back to the grocery stores because it's a lot easier the, to do that than it is to figure out how to cook an avocado or uh, not an avocado, but a um, eggplant. Uh, you know, eggplant or a kohlrabi or you know anything that you wouldn't normally use that people are throwing into these boxes. And I, I think that having an online shopping experience uh, that's like Amazon, right? So you can go there and you can say, "Hey, I want a ribeye steak." Boom! Here's a ribeye steak from two different people. Let me click through and see: uh, is this grass fed? Is this wagyu? Uh, is it a non-GMO grain or all the questions that people might have? I think that having them have the ability of asking those questions and dig as deep as they want at the same time, making it as easy as possible and taking all the friction out of it by this comes to your front door. Uh, I think that that's the future. And so that's really where we're, we're gambling on right now. Um, and, you know, so far it's, you know, it's proven off, you know, to, to hit as many customers register and sales and our average ticket now last week was, I think, $88. Uh, there's 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 a lot of opportunity for us to to grow this. Um, so uh, system wise, you want to talk about the difference between like a food hub and a distribution company? Sure. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so we are a food hub. We're not a distribution company, and essentially what that means is that we will hold inventory for farmers, but it's on consignment, and it's under the understanding that the inventory that we have um, is not ours. It's the farmers and they're just using our facilities to store whatever it is that they're storing here. And in fact, when Amanda, our farmer liaison, when she um, onboards a new farmer, they have to sign an agreement, a consignment agreement if they're planning on keeping inventory here at Profound. that basically says just that, that they understand that what they have here is on consignment and it's really their inventory and not ours. And so 
That being said, when we pay farmers, we don't pay farmers for what they come and deliver here and put in our inventory. We pay farmers for what they sold during the week, and that can create a lot of confusion. But that's really the main difference between us and a distribution company. A distribution company, they will make they they write PO to whoever. I mean, it's not most likely it's not a local farm, but yeah, <laughs> you know whoever another distribution yeah, company, yeah. probably another distribution company, a huge farmer in you know Mexico or California, um, and they will buy everything outright, and then you know they are so buying they're buying it up front. They're right. saying, hey, we'll right. buy this pallet of whatever. Yeah, exactly. And so they, you know, will buy whatever it is, and then it's their property. I mean, it's their inventory uh, that they own um, until it's sold. And so that's that's really the main difference is we're not cutting POs. And what would, be the, what would be the disadvantages and advantages of running a distribution company versus a food hub? Uh, distribution company, I'd say probably the biggest disadvantage is man- managing spoilage, which I guess, you know, we still manage spoilage here. But, you know, it's, it's more than just um, one, I'd say, like, you know, a couple sets of eyes on, on the inventory that, that's kept here. Because it's the farmer's responsibility, they know what's here. And they know if something, you know, might be you know, here too long mm-hmm. or, you know, maybe been in the freezers too long. And so yeah. um, I think probably the biggest advantage of um, having the food hub model um, I don't. I, I think it might even be the community, like the feeling of community that you get yeah. from the local, like the local farms coming together and like everybody getting to know one another. Because when a farmer comes, I mean, they, they drop off here, right? Yeah. And so they might meet another local farmer. And so yeah, there's just, a lot of times where there's yeah. crossover and you know, there are yeah, all farmers know talking to the goat cheese yeah, farmer, exactly. and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think you know, I mean, there's definitely benefits to both the models and disadvantages to both models. Um, but I, I like the food hub model yeah. um, so far. So. so one thing that I'll, I'll kind of say that's a little bit different is the pricing structure. So as right. you said, in a distribution model, they're gonna, you know, distri- a distributor's gonna go buy a pallet of whatever, uh, you know, cucumbers, and then they're gonna break that down. They're actually gonna take things out of a pallet and then put them into boxes, or they're gonna take a box and put it into bags. Right. And uh, so there's a repacking um, that has to happen there, which also takes labor to repack and food safety Certifications got to be at a whole different level when you're now repacking. Right. Uh, so as part of that, you got to pay for all this gigantic refrigeration. Now you need you know tens of thousands of square feet, and um, you know distribution model like you said, there's waste. So now if you don't sell those cucumbers, you got to go compost them or throw them away, probably do a landfill uh, or give them away to charity or whatever that's going to happen with those. Um, but then you've got to be able to make enough money on your products to cover that waste. So in a food hub model we have a margin that we need to make and that margin covers all of our expenses from the marketing the advertising uh you know to our uh, administration our software programs the vans the the leases on the vans the gas the drivers uh, you know everything and we know what the margin is that makes sense if we sell uh, x number of products right and so uh the neat part is about what we do is that the farmers choose their own prices it's a different model. It's, uh, it's, this is not typically the way of distribution. They would go negotiate and say, I'll give you less for them. And then they're trying to make as big a margin as they can. And they also figure, hey, on these um, you know, loss leaders, we're, gonna, we're not going to make very much money on this, but we're going to make it up over here because we'll make 10 times what we paid for it. Uh, we don't have to do any of that kind of math. We just simply add on our margin. And there's going to be some products that um, you know, don't make sense for us to sell because they won't fit inside of the margin. And then there's other products that we'll just do smoking well and we'll be able to move a ton of. Um, so that kind of leads into a question here from the Craven Local Food Marketplace. Uh, and it says, any best, any best selling products to retail customers that were surprising? And have you considered add, adding locally made household items? So uh, this week, we actually added on our first value added. So until this week, we were only selling um, meats, protein, and we had a couple of cheeses. Uh, we did a few weeks of a dairy producer, but you know, really it was just pretty basic stuff. So this week we now have two bakeries that came on. Um, one of them is called Girl with Flour, and she's the artisan bakery doing, you know, I think it's like 20 loaves a, a week or something. It's very, very low quantity, but they are amazing loaves of bread. And the other one's a little bit larger bakery that you know is probably doing thousands of, a week for the Dallas area. Um, it's called Empire Baking, and so we're like completely blown away at the, what they're doing. Now we missed the coaching to tell them not to sell things by the each and to come up with packaging. So. 
I think in the first three or four hours yesterday, we sold 59 bagels each for a dollar or whatever they were, right? <laughs> and so now we're going to have to go through and like, you know, are they going to bring us those all counted out with the names on them or we're going to have to count them? So we switched that to a six or 12 pack and uh, they're, now they're selling that as well. So that's the kind of the coaching that we'll give farmers is, hey, uh, you know, maybe these eggs are just a little bit too much money because they're just not going to sell for that with the margin. Um, and we then we make the decision, do we list something that's going to be expensive anyway and see how it goes? Or do we not list that and say, hey, you know, we understand that you just can't work with these prices um, and, you know, kind of let that farmer know that. Um, and we had to have a really hard conversation last week with one of our dairy producers. Uh, you know, they were selling milk uh, and with our margin was twelve and a half dollars a gallon. And, you know, yeah, there's a shortage right now in the grocery stores, but that doesn't mean that, you know, that's a fair price for people to pay. Um, and, uh, you know, not raw milk guys, we don't, we don't sell raw milk, but, um, you know, so that's one, I think we had, or we added jams this week. So yeah, we sold a few, yeah, the few of the jams, jams, which is kind of yeah. cool. We're talking to a pickle maker and having them come on with their, uh, he makes all kinds of different pickles. Um, any other value? Oh, and then uh, we also brought on a, um, a gluten-free cookie maker. So she's got like six different kinds of uh, gluten-free cookies. And we're selling some of those now, which is kind of cool. So I think they're in a six pack or a 10 pack or something. Um, and so, yes, the, we're absolutely open to some of these household items. Um, we're definitely looking for some soaps, uh, you know, some an artisan soap maker that's got some. Um, we're pretty much open to anything that you would see at a farmer's market, except for crafty stuff. You know, anything that an artist is going to make, probably that's not our cup of tea. We're not, we're not doing one-off stuff like that. Uh, and also being careful that we're looking for uh, the right kind of partners that are look, you know, maybe don't have the distribution model, but they also have enough quantity where it makes sense to drive over to us to deliver it. So that's been another challenge we've had with the Food Hub is someone said, hey, great, this sounds amazing. And then we sold $27 worth and their farm was two hours away. So they had to drive for two hours to bring us 27 bucks worth of yeah. stuff. And there's only so many weeks in a row that you're going to do that before you go, hey, this just isn't, you know, we're not selling enough. And because we're not buying and reselling, we don't know if something's going to go or not. So we're going to have a little bit of a, you know, let's give it a try and see how it goes. Um, so if there's anything as specific you'd like us to, to speak to on that, I'm open to, you know, open to any of that. Or if you have any ideas, we're definitely open there as well. Uh, we know there's a lot of categories that we're short on. Uh, we don't have a honey producer right now. And it's kind of ridiculous because you can do honey in North Dallas really well. Um, so we're just working with some producers that are not already selling out all of their products retail themselves. Um, you know, one of the things that we've done in the last couple of weeks was actually, uh, as we saw the shift to our business and we lost a hundred percent of our business, we started thinking who else just lost a hundred percent of their business because they probably got some products that they need to move. And they probably have some employees that need to be paid. Uh, and then how do we help them get to the retail customers? And that's where we came up with the, the bakers. Uh, we took on a, uh, a very large, uh, uh, well, large, not compared to large, uh, cattle farms, but large compared to the ones we've worked with in the past, uh, Wagyu farm called A Bar N. And now they've listed their strip steaks, flat irons, briskets, um, a lot of the cuts that we could never get before because it didn't make sense to sell them to restaurants. They, you know, the, the margins just weren't there. And it, uh, you know, carrying meat is a whole different level of food safety. Uh, it's heavier, so it's a lot harder to get in boxes inside of the, you know, versus a case of lettuce is a lot lighter than a 15 pound brisket. Um, so a lot of a lot of those kind of challenges and items that we're looking at, and uh, the you know the advantage of having the retail is that's really going to have us have the whole gambit of anything that people would want to use at home, and then as part of our values, uh, we want to do things that are grown locally, that are made locally, or sourced locally, uh, where that money can stay in our economy, in our local economy, um, and you know our, our long term thinking has us go. This is the kind of thing that uh, you know our area in particular really really needs. And this is what's going to have us be more resilient when the next virus comes around or uh, the next economic downturn or any of these other problems because we have our food supply local. Uh, and, you know, that's number one is being able to feed people from in and around cities. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, one of the best things that we did strategically, at least starting out, we we're talking about advice earlier, is just starting with four zip codes. I think that this thing would have been completely chaos we, if yeah. we had tried to do you know even you know twice that many if we had tried to do eight zip codes at once i don't think it would have been um sustainable and in that for in the first two weeks we've been able to learn so much 
Yes. And absolutely. last week we did release two more zip codes, so we did six total last week. Um, but you know, talking about advice for other food hubs, I think that would be really good advice. It's not necessarily start small, but like start with a manageable amount or what you think could be a manageable amount, um, yeah. at least at the beginning, to test your model. I, I think you know we're, uh, we built this company because we were really good at listening to customers. And right now we're getting emails, texts, phone calls, and then uh, you know people registering on our website from all of these zip codes all over the Dallas area. I mean, we've had some in Austin, uh, you know, which is three and a half hours south, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that the um, you know half me and my marketing side, I like I like the marketing part of this. Half me thinks, man, we just need to serve these people. These people want us. They're begging for us. We gotta go there. We gotta get this for them. And then uh, the other part of me goes is I want to have a long-term business. And if we start spreading really thin and driving 30 minutes in between stops, we're never going to have this be a viable business. So we need to saturate one area really deep, like dig the hole deep before we start going wide. Um, and the, you know, the hard part about that is how long is the pandemic going to last? Because this is really the, the, uh, the key that people are asking for. They're wanting this right now because, like I said earlier, they're, they're asking for these locally grown sustainable foods. And will this still be on their mind in three months when we're ready to open the next zip code? Uh, you know, you know, I don't know. Um, I think, and I, I can, you know, I can hope that we get the one really good thing we get out of this whole COVID thing is that um, we change people's buying habits. So we really want to get people used to buying every single week and not buying stuff at the grocery store that they can buy locally. And yeah, it might be a couple bucks more, but it's easy. It's delivered to your door. There's no delivery charge. Um, and you know that you're supporting farmers, and here's exactly the farmers that you're supporting. Um, and you know, I think that, that is a, that's how we build a, a resilient business. So uh, the advice is if you're, if you're going local, don't get yourself spread too thin. We have done it. Uh, we were having constant problems uh, when we had our distribution to restaurants because we would have some outliers. Uh, we had one in Fort Worth uh, that was buying $300 a week, but it was in uh, 45 minutes each way. And we learned really quickly that $300 sounds like a lot of money. Uh, and it occurs to me on my little teeny farm, like 300 bucks a week is awesome to work with an amazing chef in Fort Worth. But once we did the math on it, realized that now I'm paying a guy to go over there. Uh, and then how many stops in Dallas could we hit in that exact same two and a half hours that it was taking to get to Fort Worth to do the delivery. And it, we had to cut off Fort Worth. Um, and it's much easier to build up demand in a very small area and get everybody else outside that area waiting and asking uh, so when we are ready to launch, they're going to be ready to start buying uh, in a lot more numbers. And so this kind of the, the game of no, you can't have us yet, I think is going to pay off in the long run of getting getting these people uh, kind of built up and excited. Uh, you know, every post that we've done that, um, you know, the first post we did when we announced it has had 450 shares, 70,000 views. Uh, and then I did some follow up posts where I said, hey, here's how week one went. And that one got, you know, 150 shares. And people are putting in their neighborhood. So what we thought about is, is how do we decide where to go to next? Where's the next zip code that we expand to? Once we get this shit under control, where are we going to go after that? Uh, and there's, you know, half of me says logically, we just go to the next zip code over. Uh, but the problem with that kind of growth is, is that what if there's a zip code that's two over, but has three times as many people that want us there? Or there's a neighborhood that they say, hey, we'll get all 30 people on our block to buy from you every week if you come deliver here. Uh, so now what we've done to identify these pockets is we created a mailing list. The mailing list, we you know, links to MailChimp and, you know, I'm not the web person, so I'm not going to tell you how it works. But uh, once they put in their mailing address, if they're not in our current zip code, uh, it files that away. And we've got a program that is now looking at how many from each zip code are we getting. So we've got the database on where to launch to next. Uh, and the, there's two hot spots for us. One is in downtown Dallas, one's in Frisco, which is a suburb about 30 minutes away. It's actually closer than downtown. Um, and we're not ready to launch deliveries there yet because we haven't saturated the six zip codes that we have yet and in a way that we feel is sustainable. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to launch profound pickups. Now, this is our short term thinking of, hey, we need to get as much business now while we can. Uh, and then use that money to fund and continue to grow the delivery model over here because I don't think pickups are a super sustainable model, uh, you know, past this pandemic, right? So we're going to start some pickups. And what we're going to do with that is we're going to use that to be able to collect all of these buyers and their locations. And as soon as it makes sense to deliver to them, we're going to actually improve our level of service because now they're not going to have to go wait in line on a Saturday for two hours where while we're loading the car along with everybody else's car. We can send the truck direct to their door. 
So that's kind of our expansion plans with how we're going to pick what areas we choose to go to. Um, I see we got a few questions coming on. I'm going to jump in and answer those unless you, get, you want to add anything on that. No. no okay, cool. So Isaac uh, Ferrix says, question, what system are you using to handle your orders? Uh, so Josh, I'll let you, you want to, we said it in the beginning, we'll jump right back into that though. What system do we use? Yeah, it's called Local Food Marketplace. And so you can just look for localfoodmarketplace.com um, and find out all about it. They're awesome. And um, it's a yearly fee, I think, and it kind of just depends on it, how it many is, delivery days. Yeah. You know, I mean, it is expensive, but it, they have yeah. amazing customer service. Yeah, I, I would say that unless you have um, a group of farmers that you're already working with or you're a medium-sized farm probably doing more than $250,000 in gross sales, that uh, this program is probably going to be outpricing you a little bit, and you might be better off with a simpler solution. Uh, we've got some farm friends that run uh, Shopify accounts on their websites, um, and this particular program for us works really, really well because now we manage, like we said, about 40-something vendors. So as the customers place their order, there's a cutoff. So I guess I could talk about how the system works for a minute. So um, the ordering period starts Friday night at midnight or Saturday morning at midnight. And then it goes through Wednesday at midnight. So that ordering period is when everyone places all their orders. Wednesday night at midnight, the ordering period stops. All of our vendors, all the farmers, ranchers, and producers get an email. That email is their pick ticket. So uh, if it's a soil farmer, it says, hey, you need X amount of number of pounds of your potatoes or your radishes. Uh, and the, the bread people, here's the, all of the different varieties of bread. It actually shows them who the customer is. So all of our vendors can see where the food is going. Uh, in the past with restaurants, it was really important because some restaurants like things specific or a specific way. Uh, with retail, we're really trying to create a system that's streamlined so that doesn't matter quite as much. But the important part of it is that because we're a food hub, it's really transparent. We don't hide our vendors. We don't hide our customers. We just tell everybody everything and we provide enough service that it makes sense for them to work with us. And, and uh, essentially the customers pay our little margin. So. Um, when that ordering period cuts off, they get the order, they do the pick, and then they bring the products to us on Thursday mornings. And for retail customers, we deliver on Friday nights. Uh, for our few chefs that are left, we're delivering on Thursday afternoons. So that allows us time to pack everything uh, and then repack it all when it comes time to put it in the totes and then load it in the vans and go around and do deliveries. So next question, uh, would you ever consider private labeling? So everything comes to you in the hub, be labeled profound foods. Uh, that's another great question. So um, the we actually have uh, two private labels that we do right now. So one of the things when we when we launched is we want to be careful not to confuse our chef clients. And so my farm, you know, we only had, you know, I think we had about uh, four or five thousand square feet of lettuce growing in deep water culture hydroponics. And the when we sold out, we, we knew that there was a need for selling more lettuce, but I didn't want to list. I wanted to go buy lettuce from another farm, but I didn't want to have it be profound microfarms lettuce and then this farm's lettuce and this farm's lettuce and this farm's lettuce. I just wanted to have a standard unit which chefs would know what they got. And then there would also be, there wouldn't be any kind of like, you know, this farm's got too much lettuce and now he's dropping the price and now we have to drop our price to compete and then it's a race to the bottom. So on some of the green products that are uh, similar to a couple of different farms, we'll white label those. Uh, and I think that that's probably going to be less important going to retail. Uh, so right now we're actually going to be moving some of those white label microgreens and white label uh, uh, lettuce products over to the individual farm names because retail customers are just looking at, oh, I want an artisan mix half a pound from this farm and I want a spring mix a quarter pound from this farm. Uh, so I think that that matters a little bit less than the white labeling. It was more so just to keep the customers uh, from doing that. Um, and then the big thing is, is that we want the transparency. We want our customers to see all of the farmers and their practices. And uh, you know, if you guys go to our website, profoundfoods.com, click on producers, it'll show you exactly who we're working with. And if you click on that, there's a little teeny bio in there or a link to their website that says more about what they're doing. Um, you know, the risk in that for us is, is that people could theoretically go around us and they can just go straight to the farmer and buy from the farm. Uh, and in the past, that really hasn't been a problem at all, even with chefs and high ticket items because we're providing the value of giving them one-stop invoicing. We make it easy to order. Uh, you're not having to call or text anybody, arrange a delivery. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's simple, it's streamlined, it's a process. And I think that's really how we're gonna grow our local food economy is by making things easy for people. Uh, you know, even farmer's markets are not easy for people. It's not easy for me to wake up on a Saturday morning and skip all the kids stuff to go to the farmer's market. So 
you know, deliver to your, your home is really where we're, we're placing our gamble. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, question may I ask what the margin is? So the margin for our wholesale accounts to our restaurants and chefs is 20%. It's always been 20%. We actually figured that 20% was the minimum number that we could have and have a viable business. Uh, so that way it gave the chefs the lowest possible price and it gave the farmer the highest possible price. Uh, and so we were able to run this last year on that margin. Uh, we did find out that that is uh, Very low. <laughs> it's too low. Uh, and we were, you know, we're skinning by. I ended up having to put some of my uh, money into the company this year to hit all of our payroll because it was just a little bit too small of a margin. So even though we were doing a ton of business, uh, that was kind of tough. So when we launched retail, we saw a couple of things. Number one is it was going to be a lot more expensive to deliver because of the number of stops. Um, it's going to be a lot more wear and tear on our vans and because we had to have two drivers. And I can kind of talk about that here in a minute about why we feel like we need a driver and a, and a, and a passenger in each van. So we're doubling up our labor cost as well as it takes a lot longer to load individual totes of small quantities of items as it did when we were doing large quantities of items to chefs and restaurants. So we we're doing the same dollars, but it's we're, we're actually spending a lot more on labor cost. So our retail margin is 40%. So that means the farmer puts on uh, whatever price they put on, the system automatically marks it up 40%, regardless of what kind of product it is, cheese, meats, dairy, you know, uh, produce, anything. Um, let's see, so did I miss any other questions? So Bootstrap Farmer says, are the value add products prepared in commercial kitchens? How do you uh, maintain temp in deliveries, site drops or home delivery? Are all the homes or other locations like, are they all homes or other locations like offices? So to answer that question, that are, are all of those different questions. Number one, yes, every value added good that we've done so far and will do in the future will be produced in a commercial kitchen. There is a cottage, uh, cottage food law in Texas that means that you do not always have to do things in a commercial kitchen. However, we believe for our liability purposes that that will be one of our requirements. Uh, now, one advantage is, is because we have a food hub and really good relationships with all of our producers, we have access to commercial kitchens at little to no cost. So if someone came to us and said, hey, I'm doing um, you know, pickles, uh, but I'm doing them out of my house, but I'd really love to work with you. I've got the quantity, the pricing makes sense. I can deliver to you on the, in the time slot that I need to deliver to you in, but it's not a commercial kitchen. We would simply say, where do you live? Let's get you to a commercial kitchen and get these same things made. Make sure you've got your permits and that sort of thing. Uh, so I hope that answers that question on the commercial kitchen side. Um, uh, another thing that I'll say that you didn't ask is we require all of our farms to have uh, how much insurance? Is it two million dollars? I, don't really off the top of my head. I think yeah, it's two million dollars of insurance that they have to have, and we have relationships with insurance agents. So if they don't have that because they're a new and beginning farmer, we'll direct them to one of our resources there, and they'll get affordable quotes for that uh, with people that we know and respect. Um, so maintaining temp on delivery. So honestly, that was a challenge this week, and uh, we dropped the ball on it. It took us way too long to load. So. Uh, in the past for restaurants, we would essentially have, uh, we have refrigerated trucks and then we have coolers. So we would put all of our proteins that were frozen inside of coolers inside the refrigerated truck. So we'd pull up at a restaurant, we'd grab our tote full of all of the small things, clamshells and bags. We'd grab whatever cases of kale, lettuces or whatever we had, uh, tomatoes. And then we would reach into the cooler, we'd grab the bag out that it was labeled whatever the restaurant name is, and then we'd run in. So we were able to really easily we were uh, you know we were only grabbing what was on the invoice and for home deliveries we found we we put all of the proteins in the tote and then all the totes in the back of the refrigerated van and that didn't cut it so um, we were not able to maintain temp and we're kind of in a crisis mode right now honestly and figuring that out so we're looking at this week we're going to go back to the way we were doing it with restaurants it's just going to take a lot more work because now there's going to be 50 bags inside of a, a coolers in the back uh, and so we'll have to grab the tote and the bag uh, and then go from there. I think another important part to, to ask of how, how we actually physically do the deliveries is as part of signing up, we've told all of our customers that they are required to have their own cooler, like a beer cooler, an Igloo or a, a Yeti or whatever, on their doorstep for us to deliver to. And it should be, it should be iced or with cool packs in it. And uh, so far, it's actually been pretty surprising. Um, about 10% of people that we deliver to have not had their coolers out. So um, yeah, I think it's really impressive that they remember to set their coolers out. Uh, for us, you know, we're looking at getting the folding totes. I've seen some other food delivery companies do that or cooler bags or all of these different things. Uh, number one, that shit's expensive. 
and we had to have a whole lot of them. We had 90 deliveries this week. So if we had a $10 solution, that's a lot of money to have out on, uh, you know, as we're still figuring this thing out. Plus now we need an ice solution, a cooling solution. And then when we, if we uh, have a swap program or we're picking it up the next week when we drop off, what happens if they don't pick up the next week? That's number one, now we've lost that tote. Do we charge them for it? How does that work? Uh, and if we are picking it up, how do I sanitize that? So now I got to pay a guy to wash it with bleach and then there's a liability and if we're not sanitizing it right uh, or what if they don't clean it and it leaks meat juice into it and now all of a sudden we've got you know stinky coolers or potentially hazardous coolers. Um, so we're really uh, excited that that so far has worked out really well. Uh, we are coming up with a backup solution for how we handle that moving forward. Luckily, everyone should be their ass at home right now. So uh, most people are home and we watch them watching us through the blinds, they're opening the blinds, they're waving at us. Uh, you know, they're not coming outside to interact with us. So that's one of the best parts about the, the way that this uh, virus is working is that people don't wanna interact. So we go there, we lift the cooler, we put the proteins in first, we put the vegetables and stuff on top of that. Everything is all completely packaged in its own bag or its own clamshell, its own uh, frozen bag. Uh, so we put all that in and then we leave a little letter that's a thank you letter that says like week two update that says what's coming next week or new producers and, and, and a thank you. Uh, we say how to share about us on social media, go to Nextdoor app, do it in the neighborhood face groups. Uh, we say if there's any complaints, don't share that on social media, contact us directly. Um, and so we deliver to their cooler and I think in the foreseeable future we'll be doing that moving forward. And then we'll also have a backup cooler plan. So that way we can actually, you know, if we get there, they forget to put their cooler out. Maybe we put one out that week and then we build them $30 for a cooler fee. And then they just keep that and now they have a cooler. Um, so right now we're doing home deliveries only. We had two apartment deliveries uh, this second week, which was our first two apartments. And both of them failed. Uh, number one, she didn't give us a building number, so we were wandering around, we had to wait, we didn't have a code to get in, so we didn't know how to get in, we followed another car in, and then we drove around in circles looking for this apartment number to find out that every building in the complex has the exact same apartment number, so you have to know the building number. And uh, we ended up having to call them, she didn't answer, so we had to bring that delivery the next day. The second apartment, we get there, we drive around, we can't find it, the stairwells are all locked. So we can't even get to where the apartment is. We call her, she answers, Oh, I'll come right down. The apartment's on lockdown, so I have to come out and meet you. You have to call me when you get here, and then I'll come down three flights of stairs and then come out and meet you with my cooler. And sweetest old lady, uh, but I'm looking at, like, man, the, the, the amount of time that it takes to stop at apartments is tough, so I'm not sure how we're going to handle that. My team says we have to deliver to them. I'm kind of like, we just need to put the kibosh on, on difficult deliveries right now. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how we roll with that. Uh, no offices yet because, um, really, there needs to be people there to get those coolers because the coolers aren't gonna keep the meat and the produce and everything cold for very long. So uh, in the future, maybe right now, no one should be in office buildings anyway. So um, hopefully that answers that. Uh, talk to us about local food marketplace. If we are a small farm that is looking to pivot, is it worth the cost of local food marketplace? So uh, small farm is, you're gonna to have to figure out your definition of that. I would uh, say just reach out to them. Yeah, reach out to them. Um, we have a pretty advanced version. There's uh, you know, you get this, and then if you want to add this, 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 and so you can add all of these things. Um, I think we pay, is it, it's over $3,000 a year. Uh, I don't think it's quite $3,000. So two to $3,000 a year. Uh, for us, it seemed really expensive, but on the other hand, the amount of uh, effort and labor that we saved from the old-fashioned way I was, I used to do it before that, uh, was text messages. Um, you know, it was it was a nightmare. We're doing night and day business, and I can't. We, we would not be able to run the business we're doing right now without that software or something that's very much like it. I do know that there's um, three or four other softwares out there that you can get that maybe are not quite as robust as this one, uh, and they may be now because we did our research a year and a half ago. But um, you know, we're, we're really happy with it. Um, uh, another question: Do we charge a delivery fee? So it's a good question. Uh, one of the things with me that drives some of the other people crazy, like Josh and some of the other people on our team, is I like to take all the friction out of things. And uh, I don't like delivery fees. Um, that's why I buy shit on Amazon. So uh, we said no delivery fee. We do have an order minimum, which we actually did not ever have with restaurants. We had no order minimum. So we, we'd actually go for a restaurant. We would go for less money than we would go to people's houses for now. So we set the minimum at $35. Uh, and we're also in conversation right now is add we, as we add zip codes that are a little bit further away, we're thinking about adding some delivery fees on there. Uh, so if we're gonna drive to, you know, from where we are in Lucas down to Dallas, you know, maybe that's a $15 delivery fee plus a $35 minimum. 
And I think people would be pretty understanding, especially in the current climate we have. Uh, I don't know that it would have been the same if we launched this three weeks ago, but um, so that's one. And we're also going to do uh, with one of our pickup locations is at a brewery. So at the brewery, they said, hey, we want to sell beer. Uh, so what we're actually going to do with that one is, is we're going to give away free beer because, uh, you know, what makes it easier to do someone uh, do business with somebody if they give you free alcohol? So uh, if you pay a $10 pickup charge, you're going to get a free six pack of beer. So we're working on the logistics, legalities of that. Um, you won't have to take the beer, uh, but if you get a delivery, we're going to be able to uh, give a free six pack of beer and then we'll have a little bit of money we can essentially pay in rent to the brewery for letting us be there and use their pickup location. So uh, we're pretty excited about how that's going to work. Uh, any issues with gated communities or HOA? So uh, another great question. So this last time we had two gated communities, one with the security guard. Uh, and the security guard uh, was interesting because it took about five minutes to get in there because she had to fill out her information. I had to hold my ID because no, no one wants to touch anything right now. <laughs> and uh, so once we got through there, we were able to get to the home pretty quickly. So that was, that was easy. We'll continue doing that. Um, gated HOAs, uh, typically we pulled up at a several of them, several of them. You punch in the code, the door opens, you drive to the home, it's pretty straightforward. So it, it doesn't even add a minute on door deliveries. Uh, and we'll continue doing that for sure. Um, let's see. Question, what has sold really well and has not, and, and, and what has not in your experience? So in my two weeks of experience, <laughs> that, that is our, our launch into retail sales, uh, proteins are selling well. People are buying a lot of ground meat. They're buying all of our chickens, all of our eggs. Uh, dairy is selling well. Uh, bread has only been up for two days now, right. today and yesterday, and that's doing really well so far. I think it's already like five or six hundred dollars in bread. Um, what's not selling well? Stuff from my farm. So it's the rare culinary herbs. It's the microgreens aren't doing very well. Um, I think last week we sold thirty bucks worth. I mean, it was nothing. Um, edible flowers are not selling well. We have some assorted flowers on there, and uh, I think we sold two or three packages, so that would be less than thirty dollars. Um, and uh, a lot of the weird stuff, you know, uh, we, we were growing all kinds of weird things and, you know, six different kinds of watercress, uh, and that's not selling very well. So I think that total this week, um, you know, we're, we're probably going to see under a thousand dollars in sales from my farm, which is, like I said, one of the reasons why we've decided we we're going to downsize quickly until we can ramp back up with products that they would buy. Um, also mushroom sales have been really low. We were selling a ton of mushrooms to restaurants, like hundreds of pounds a week. And that number went to like two pounds a week right now. So we're working on some projects right now with actually a couple of chefs to start doing some cooking videos. We're going to be putting out a ton on social media with our chefs who are currently unemployed or underemployed cooking and preparing a lot of the foods that they buy from us and telling people, here's the Texas fungus mushrooms I'm using. Here's how I prep them. And we're going to have them doing it in their home kitchens or in other home kitchens. Uh, not in commercial kitchens. So that way our customers are going to be able to relate to them and they're going to know exactly here's how you cook an oyster mushroom. If you want to have a meal like you would have had two weeks ago at a restaurant, you can do it yourself with these amazing ingredients. So we're working on that content right now. We've also got a team working on uh, recipe cards. Uh, how do you use these things? How do you cook them? Best handling? You know, what's the best way to store these things? There's a reason why mushrooms come in a brown paper bag and not inside of a plastic clamshell. So I think that uh, we'll see a lot of that coming up. Um, so Bootstrap Farmer says, any security concerns? Uh, that's one that, you know, this is this would be the group of people I would probably talk to that in front of. We don't we don't kind of share that with a lot of people, but uh, absolutely we have security concerns. You know, there's a, you know, being a farmer, you think a lot about the future and you think a lot about different options and, and things that can happen, specifically disaster scenarios. And, you know, the, the thought's definitely gone through our heads about, you know, if people are going hungry, what happens? Uh, you know, people can make poor decisions when they're not hungry. So when they get hungry, that's a whole nother ball game. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we've opted to do delivery routes. Uh, and we've opted to have two drivers. So we uh, have always have two people in a vehicle. Um, we've got, so we got one person to watch the other person's back. Uh, we also have more uh, security so things won't go missing or anything like that. Um, and we've got on mark vans. So we actually have magnetic logos on our vans. We took all of our magnetic logos off of our vans. So nobody knows when we're coming. Uh, you know, yes, it would be really good marketing to have this be seen in people's neighborhoods. Uh, at the same time, I want to make sure that people don't see where we're coming and don't know where we are. Uh, there is a lot of money's worth of uh, products and a lot of food on these vans at any given time. 
So, you know, just to kind of avoid any kind of confrontation or anything like that, we've, we've definitely put some thought into the security side of that. Uh, we've also, also beefed up security on the farm. We have sensors and cameras all over, uh, alarm systems. We've got locks on our freezers and uh, all of that kind of thing for extra protection, uh, as well as there's almost always someone on the farm, uh, you know, watching on top of that. So um, let's see, you use it for the chefs as well. How do you handle the set the pars for chefs in the system? Oh, I think he's talking about local food market. Yeah, go ahead and answer that one, would you? Uh, I'm not really sure what you mean by pars for the chefs. Is he talking the, about like the, standing orders or? Uh, yeah, so standing order. You can talk. You can talk for a minute about standing orders and um, like availability versus inventory, um, and how like farmers upload things and can you know I guess. Um, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean basically, like I said earlier, farmers can upload their own availability, and typically Amanda, our farmer liaison, she'll manage that. So she'll make sure that the farm availability. Um, is correct and up to date and accurate. Um, and so, as far as standing orders go, we have uh, LFM does have the capability of, of putting in standing orders, um, which is really really nice. The only downside is, is right now, and I know I've talked to him about it because I mean they're a young company and so they're moving as fast as they can, growing as fast as they can. Um, that is in the works for chefs to be able to manage their own standing orders within the the. The software so I can go in or, or we can go in and manage their standing orders and they can text us we can ask them like hey what do you want on a weekly basis and then we'll put in their order and then we can run it with essentially just a couple clicks of a button yeah um, after we do the updates for the week and generate their orders for the week and so that, that is that's really nice um, minimum orders like Jeff was saying we don't really have minimum orders for chefs mm -hmm. I mean it's something we've considered for um, like going to Fort Worth, you can have different delivery zones and each one of those delivery zones can have a different minimum order, which is really, really nice. Mm -hmm. um, so we've debated doing it for like Denton or for Fort Worth, but we haven't pulled the trigger or we hadn't pulled the trigger um, as you know, until yeah. like, yeah. And when local food marketplace figures out standing orders for retail customers, that will be huge for us. I think, I think um, that's going to be really good. That's also going to come up with a new problem as well of if they have a standing order, are they going to remember to put their cooler on the porch? Are they going to remember right. to put ice in it? Because I think that a standing order is one of those things where you just forget that it was coming that day. Right. Um, and so that I kind of like the method of them having to order every week. On the other hand, I really like the reliability. You know, when we, when we two weeks ago we were selling to chefs, seventy percent of our business was standing orders. Right. And it was super easy to process. It was really easy. We'd allow them to adjust their standing orders because if you're already working with restaurants, you know that there is no such thing as a standing order that they agree to take it no matter what. Uh, and you wouldn't want them throwing away food anyway. So uh, it, in the past, it was easy to manage for us. And that's uh, probably going to be, if we wanted to turn that on now, it would probably add another layer of difficulty. Uh, however, I think that we're going to be fine for the meanwhile. So uh, you know, two weeks of data tell us the first week we had 56 customers. The second week we had 90 customers. And of the 90, uh, what was it? Uh, 90, 28 were repeat customers. So uh, we're really happy with that. And I think that people are gonna be kind of learning how, how much quantity things are gonna go. And we're, we're debating, is it gonna be like in every other week they order something or is it every week? Uh, so out of the repeat customers, we've seen a lot of notes on that. Uh, one thing that completely blew me away this time that I would have never have guessed uh, in a million years uh, I was out on deliveries with on one of the trucks and our other truck went out. Uh, both trucks came back with tips. People wrote on a little whiteboard, uh, one of the houses I went to, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this is so great, thank you. There's a tip underneath the cooler. And they left money under the cooler. It was actually $67 in tips uh, from multiple different homes that left tips under the coolers. We didn't ask for this. Uh, I was not expecting this, but it was kind of a nice little bonus for the guys. Uh, you know, have a little, you know, a few extra dollars. Uh, but that kind of shows the level of uh, how much people appreciate this right now. Uh, we, we really couldn't have picked a better time to launch this kind of thing. So yeah. I see there's some more comments coming back in. Uh, thank you both. Love you. And uh, we'll raise a glass soon. Thank you so much for your time. I guess you guys are telling me that we're uh, rambling on. Uh, one other thing from Heather yeah. here is, are you looking for more farmers? Absolutely we are. Uh, we're onboarding farms like by the week. You know, we, we would love to get some more farmers on. <laughs> Uh, please feel free to reach out to Amanda at profoundfoods.com yeah. and she's our farmer relations specialist and she'll get you onboarded or you can simply just go to profoundfoods.com and fill out your producer application uh, and obviously that would work with people that are local to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. 
uh, or we're willing to deliver to the Dallas Fort Worth area to our, our food hub. So guys, thank you so much. I'm glad to be able to, we could kind of share our story and what we're working on here. Uh, if you have any questions or anything like that, email is the best way to reach me. I'm slammed right now, but I'll get back to you as soon as possible. My email is jeff at profoundfoods.com. Uh, and uh, thanks for having us here, guys. Uh, definitely check out some of the, the other classes that Bootstrap Farmer and Urban Farm Academy are launching. Um, they've got a bunch more on the way and some really good classes there as well. So thank you guys. Have a great night.